Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Ibrahim Aoudeh. Gaza, Israel, the U.S., and the Palestinians is the topic for tonight. And uh, to help us discuss this, uh, we have uh, Farida Farhi. Uh, she's an independent scholar and affiliate to graduate faculty with the police uh, department at UH Manoa. Welcome, Farida. Pleasure to uh, be here. So first, uh, you uh, teach a course, or two courses actually, on the Middle East, one U.S. foreign policy and the Middle East, and then one on the Middle East. So That's could you say something about those two courses? Um, my main course is Middle East politics. Mm. It's a comparative politics class, and essentially what I try to do is to give people uh, a sense of uh, different political systems that exist in the Middle East, uh, the complexity of relationships, and um, in a sense, uh, a deeper look at what is going on in the Middle East in general. Mm -hmm. The other class is American foreign policy in the Middle East, which is both historical uh, as well as contextual in the sense that we look at the history of uh, uh, um, an American non-involvement in the Middle East mm -hmm. um, in earlier in the century and then increasing involvement and um, what happened mm -hmm. that effectively um, uh, a United States that was considered to be a non-colonial power in the Middle East ended up transforming itself and effectively becoming a Middle Eastern power yeah. um, mm. uh, and of course with all the consequences that are associated yeah. with that. I say sometimes to my students that uh, you know um, the US has borders with Iran and exactly. <laughs> Syria yeah, exactly, and all that, yeah. exactly. which is uh, interesting. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, it has occupied uh, more than just um, Iraq and Afghanistan, but also Kuwait for that exactly. matter, right? Yeah. Exactly. And uh, anyway, so uh, what I wanted to uh, start with is uh, I interviewed uh, Professor Noel Kent. He's a professor of ethnic studies, and uh, we play uh, one segment of the interview, and then we could comment on that, exactly. and uh, we'll watch that. Okay. I'm really uh, horrified by the uh, disproportional response of the Israelis to, uh, you know, to these uh, uh, handful of rockets falling on them. This is uh, incredible. It's, 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 uh, it's just, uh, there's been a massacre. And uh, I'm especially uh, horrified by this because uh, I'm Jewish and uh, my parents uh, were victimized in uh, Europe and uh, my sister and I at times have been victims of anti-Semitism too and to see uh, Jewish people carrying out this uh, program is really uh, very, very disturbing to me. Uh, I think we should know better. We were victimized in uh, many places and I think we should be able to uh, have a lot of empathy with the uh, uh, desires of the Palestinian people for uh, independence, autonomy in their own state. Yeah, I mean, this is a Noel talks about it as pogrom, a uh, pogrom with a twist. Uh, a lot of F-16s, big, uh, big bombs, uh, you know, just uh, awful um, uh, bombs, tanks, and all that kind of stuff uh, leveled at uh, the Palestinians uh, in Gaza. So um, I'm sure you uh, also talk about Gaza <laughs> in your <laughs> Middle yeah, East class. But before we do this, uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to show uh, a map uh, of uh, Gaza to show the horror of uh, the bombings that uh, occurred during the invasion, uh, the Israeli invasion and bombing of Gaza. And here uh, we have, for instance, um, um, when uh, we switch, yeah, right, okay, here. So you have this uh, small area and six kilometers by 41 kilometers, which basically is about uh, 26 um, miles in length and uh, I suppose like four miles in uh, uh, width. And it has, um, how many people does it have? It has uh, 1.5 million people, right? Yes. And um, what I want to show here is the um, population uh, density, uh, for instance, uh, per uh, one uh, square kilometer and each uh, uh, 1.6 kilometers equal one mile, by the way. So this, uh, in the north of Gaza, there's per, uh, pop density, population density, 17,000 plus 
per one square kilometer, and this shows you the density of the population. Okay. Now, what we're going to show here uh, is the following. In this area, the north, uh, we have <clears throat> per one square kilometer, you got 18 bombs coming, raining down or coming down on Gazans, uh, 311 dead, uh, 118 of them women and children, and 753 injured. Uh, 8.6 in this uh, area here, oops, sorry, in this area, 8.6 uh, kilometers, uh, I mean 8.6 bombs per one uh, square kilometer, 309 dead, 67 of those women and children, 4 or 5 uh, injured. Um, then we go down to uh, the next level here, uh, 14 uh, bombs per one square, uh, uh, per one kilometer square, 177 dead, 33 uh, women and children of those, and 413 injured. And then you can look at the rest and see uh, for yourself. Now, <clears throat> this is uh, this is an area, the size uh, qu one quarter the size of Oahu. Uh, in fact, uh, less than that, less than one quarter the size of Oahu, the the third largest uh, island in the uh, in the Hawaiian chain, right? Okay, so it just gives you an idea. So there's nowhere to hide. Anytime you bomb, you gotta hit civilians. You know, to say, for instance, that the militants were hiding behind civilians is something that really is not a true depiction of what's really going on. So where does this come from, uh, this kind of map? It's uh, from Amnesty International, BBC, Tzilim, that's the uh, Israeli human rights organization, city mayors, the economist, guardian, human rights watch, Jewish virtual library, uh, PASIA, PCBS, PCHR, that's a human rights campaign, UNRWA, United Nations uh, Relief and Work Agency, UN, uh, OCHA, which is um, the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Okay, so this is uh, just uh, to put um, our viewers, uh, uh, put Gaza for them in perspective, right? So that's what we are talking about. And this is from, um, you know, the, these killings, if you add them all up, it's like 1,300 dead and so forth. Um, these killings happened from December 27th till uh, January, till January um, I forget when exactly, but uh, it's like 28 days or something of, uh, of uh, thing. Uh, uh, so that's a, that's an interesting part. Yes, yeah. and Ibrahim, I mean, there is th also this additional thing that, you know, the Israelis made an, ar uh, you know, publicly make the argument that uh, for eight years they faced the rockets that came from Gaza and did not say anything. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately they had to do something to respond right. to the barrage right. of rockets. Right. What it's not told that in this period of eight years, the Israelis, uh, in fact, have ended up killing about 1,300 Gazaeans. Mm -hmm. uh, and the rate, ratio of the Israelis killed by the uh, rockets coming from mm -hmm. Gaza, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, as opposed to Israeli attacks on Gaza, mm -hmm. is exactly the same as it has been during this war, which right. is 100 to 1. Right. So the dynamic, this war essentially uh, uh, compacted mm -hmm. uh, a process and a dynamic that has been going on for the past eight years right. anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, I'm I'm trying to um, uh, locate um, something else here uh, to show you. I mean, like before all that, the, as you said, the Israelis have killed a lot, and how many Israelis were killed? Nine. You exactly. Know? So uh, there you go. Uh, it's just like uh, disproportionate, really, um, response that they had, and it's not. It didn't happen only. Again, mm -hmm. uh, during uh, you know December 27th till whenever it stopped, I forget now the date. Uh, but um, the the thing is that it has been happening. The genocide against the Gazan it was slow death, mm -hmm. right, over the years, and that happened uh, b even without rockets. Like uh, one of the things in terms of Gaza 
and uh, the um, uh, ceasefire is that uh, the agreement between Hamas and Israel via Egypt was that, okay, Hamas would stop the rockets, right? Uh, so long that Israel would stop its target assassinations of uh, Gazans and at the same time would open the borders and lift up, lift the siege. The Hamas people, regardless of one, uh, what one might think of Hamas, the Hamas people did live to their uh, agreement, um, whereas the Israelis never lifted the siege um, on Gaza. Yes, yes. So then when it came to a question of uh, uh, renewing the ceasefire, uh, which uh, expired on uh, what the 19th of December, the Hamas people said, "No, we're not gonna, uh, you know, uh, 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 renew the ceasefire simply because um, you haven't done uh, the lifting of the siege. You lift the siege, we renew the ceasefire." And who um, also uh, violated the ceasefire? It was the Israelis on November 4th. The ceasefire ended December 19th, right? On November 4th, the Israelis went into Gaza and had target assassinations of six people. Okay, so that's why they had the rockets after that. So anyway, um, so any more discussion on that particular uh, issue? Uh, the bottom line is that the Israelis um, um, have been unable to come up with policies that would allow them to live in peace with their neighborhood. Uh, they are a destabilizing force in the sense that because of internal dynamics in Israel and the inability to uh, uh, leave the occupied territories and allow the occupied territories to operate in ways that uh, allow people um, um, a dignified life, um, they are forced every couple of years to engage violently in their neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was only two years ago that a very similar dynamic uh, occurred in relationship to Lebanon, massive devastation of another country um, uh, on um, uh, the basis of this doctrine of disproportionate force. Um, uh, but the bottom line is that the Israelis never end up getting the result they want mm -hmm. because they're the result they want is complete emasculation and submission of the neighboring people, the mm -hmm. people that they live. And that can never happen. Mm -hmm. So long as the Palestinians exist, by definition, they resist. Yeah. So even if they use this amount of disproportionate uh, force, they ultimately end up being dissatisfied with the result. Mm -hmm. And um, sure enough, in another uh, year or even a couple of years, there has to be yet another operation to um, give the Israelis a sense of security that they search so badly and they never seem to be able to get. Uh, and that has become a tremendous problem for the Middle East as a whole because this Israeli search for security is itself. Uh, has become the source of insecurity for no, the whole right. Middle East and a real issue for um, 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 obviously not only the people who are subject to the kind of violence that is imposed on them, but uh, for all the Arab regimes in the area, uh, supporters of Israel in Europe and United mm -hmm. States and elsewhere. Right. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of examples one would uh, put forth uh, to show the instability and the uh, lack of acceptance of the peoples of the Middle East to uh, the state of Israel uh, is uh, the um, peace agreement uh, with Egypt and the peace agreement with Jordan. Uh, while there has been peace between the uh, states of Jordan and Israel on, uh, in one um, uh, arrangement and then Egypt and Israel in another, uh, there has never been a normalization. Um, of relations among the two peoples. And the reason for this is exactly what you are talking about, that uh, the Israeli state wants to be part of the Middle East, um, but by what method? By having the other people cry uncle and say, we submit, right? Mm. And therefore, let's live in peace like brothers and sisters. It's not, that's not going to happen. You either be part of the Middle East and uh, consider everybody equal, 
yeah, and on an e uh, treat them on an equal footing, or uh, you're not going to have this normalization that you are so desperately looking for because of, uh, you know, the arrogance and the attitude of the Israelis with firepower, they try to deal with all these kinds of uh, problems. So I think that um, would, uh, you know, show that, in fact, uh, you know, what you have uh, said is uh, true as well. Yeah, there is also a basic contradiction in terms of the way the Israelis are trying to portray themselves in the Middle East itself as opposed to in relationship to um, um, the Western world that the Israelis would like to consider as allies. So, for example, in relationship to Gaza, uh, the Israelis, uh, um, and in fact, um, uh, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert has said it very clear that we want the Palestinians to understand that if they use uh, rockets against us, we will use disproportionate force. Mm -hmm. He has actually used the language mm -hmm. of disproportionate force. But when they are facing the Western criticism that this is not the civilized way of doing this, their reaction is, no, actually we have been extremely restrained right, yeah. and we took eight years of rocket. So you can see the dance that the Israelis mm -hmm. are engaged in. On one hand, they want the Arab world to understand the Israelis are strong and can crush mm -hmm. any kind of resistance or even will to resistance. And, but yet on the other hand, they want the rest of the world to think that the Israelis are yeah. actually uh, um, uh, civilized members right. or uh, uh, rational members of the uh, global liberal community. And that dance during this Gaza operation Right. started to break down yes. uh, because yeah. it was just simply, as you showed in the map, the smallness of Gaza, the reality that Gaza is effectively a concentration mm -hmm. camp, is a place where, you know, one and a half million people are effectively imprisoned. Um, uh, they cannot go anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea that the Israelis are going to drop pamphlets on top of buildings telling them we're going to bomb, you go someplace else, yeah. is absurd, <laughs> yeah. you know, as considering that Egypt is closing Rafa and they cannot move, you know, the play, you know, there is they, literally the only place they can go is to jump into the sea, right. you know. Um, so that effectively became a dance that the Israelis could not manage in this particular right. um, operation. Yeah, talking about jumping into the sea, there will be Israeli boats uh, shooting at them. And in fact, they killed people on the uh, family. Exactly. They killed the family on the exactly. shores of Gaza, exactly. even before all this happened. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, in fact, uh, Gaza has been under siege for, uh, for the longest time. So uh, that's um, an, uh, an interesting part. But uh, on the question of the bifurcation in terms of Israeli propaganda and the message uh, Israel has as regards the Arabs and as regards the Europeans and the US, is that uh, some people, um, Zionists like Mayor Bloomberg, or, um, did not apparently miss that message because he was defending the question of disproportionate uh, um, use of force by giving the examples about um, the crime in New York if somebody comes and uh, tries to kill somebody, you want us to send one policeman or send like uh, the, you know, I don't know, a SWAT team or something like that. But uh, the uh, but, yeah. of but of course uh, the. Uh, kind of um, example is not... Uh, not only uh, that, yeah. even if when you send the SWAT team, the SWAT team doesn't blow up the house in oh, which yeah. the murder oh, yeah. has occurred. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that that's the kind of ridiculous analogy yeah. he was making. Right. If a crime has occurred, in fact, the police and the SWAT team is uh, given the responsibility mm -hmm. to behave in a very proportional and um, um, uh, manner in mm -hmm. such a way that it does not lead to unnecessary yes. killing of yeah. all the neighborhood right, uh, right. or all the neighbors. So uh, that was certainly, I mean, it was the butt of the joke for many, yes, uh, right. um, uh, among many people. But the reality is of how insensitized people have become uh, to the kind of um, um, uh, killings that have been going right. on in the Palestinian yeah. territory. And that, I that is only made possible 
if you treat the people that you are dealing with as subhuman mm -hmm. or not uh, yeah. human enough to be treated right. uh, like other human right. beings. Because uh, to be able to bomb them and kill them, you have to dehumanize them. They exactly. become like uh, other exactly. animals and then exactly. you will kill them. I mean, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, the, the, the other thing, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, generals, I suppose, Israeli generals was saying, uh, we want to have uh, the Palestinian uh, population deep in their um, understanding and feelings, uh, etc., to know that they are a defeated, defeated people. people. Exactly. And um, I, I smile at that because it's impossible to defeat the Palestinians, not because the Palestinians are like, you know, some kind of have uh, extraterrestrial power or something like that. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in the uh, <coughs> position they are in. Uh, but because um, uh, the Palestinians are like about 8, 9 million people all over the uh, world, but with major concentrations not only in the West Bank, Gaza, and uh, inside Israel proper, uh, Palestine, uh, 1948, that is, <coughs> um, but also in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, um, and, uh, you know, the Gulf, and um, elsewhere in the Arab world and beyond that. So and you cannot defeat everybody. You know. And also yeah. in Israel itself. Absolutely, and, yeah. One you know, part million, of yeah. one, one of the consequences of what has happened um, in Gaza is that the relationships inside Israel with this uh, Arab community, Palestinian community, which is 20% of the population at least and growing, certainly a larger part of the younger population than Israel, you can see in this election that was just held today, um, increased tensions mm -hmm. within Israel uh, to the point that you actually have a political party becoming the third uh, largest party in Israel, um, um, actually calling in some cases for the expulsion of the Palestinian Israelis out of Israel or calling for loyalty tests mm -hmm. and um, there was violence today in city, Arab cities inside Israel. So, um, you know, the Palestinian issue is not uh, only outside Israel but also inside Israel yeah. and it's something that cannot be resolved yeah. uh, by this uh, will to break <laughs> the yeah. Palestinian right. will right. because the reality is that Palestinian will as I said before cannot be broken in the sense that from the Israeli point of view since we are talking about territorial conflict mm -hmm. and um, a conflict over who owns what which piece of land so long as the Palestinians exist mm -hmm. that means they are resisting yes. <laughs> and therefore the Israeli dilemma can only be solved if Every Palestinian <laughs> in the occupied ter territories are gone, yeah. you know, e either physically remo removed or physically eliminated. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, I think that is something that increasingly uh, people throughout the world mm -hmm. are coming face to face right, with that right. reality. Yeah. Um, that there is this um, real issue, mm -hmm. a real conflict mm -hmm. that cannot be uh, reduced to yeah. this formula that uh, so long as Israeli security is taken care of, Israelis will be happy. Yeah. The reality is that Israel wants somebody else's land, mm -hmm. okay? Or there are elements within the Israeli society that will never give up mm -hmm. the land that uh, they have taken over in the occupied territory so unless they are forcibly removed. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so long as there is no uh, clear understanding of that, this conflict um, cannot be resolved. Yeah. Uh, you see the precarious uh, situation of Israel. Um, if it wants to do the, um, that thing like forcibly removing like the colonialists, uh, euphemistically called settlers, uh, from say the West Bank, uh, then um, they're going to have a problem with that because some of the colonialists saying, well, we'll have to fight the Israelis who are going to like, evict us. So what do you do, I mean, in, the, in that case? Um, so that's um, for Israel to decide what they want to do with that. If they want to live, you know, as part of the Middle East and uh, on equal footing with the rest of the peoples in the Middle East. Otherwise, it's not going to work, you know, as a minority uh, like holding hostage uh, 
you know, the rest of the Israelis, because a lot of Israelis don't want, um, you know, these uh, colonialists in the West Bank, for instance, etc. So that's uh, what I want to do is uh, I want to go um, to, uh, I interviewed uh, George, uh, George Yudis, uh, and uh, we'll play this uh, uh, segment, uh, George, and then we can talk more about this. One cannot spend time in the ter occupied territories for almost any period of time without seeing the brutality. And I think this is why Israel doesn't want Israel tourists going yeah. there. This is why they don't want their own people going there. Because you go there, first of all, the checkpoints, long lines. I mean, what is this? You know, I mean, it's like we have to spend uh, 19 hours to go from uh, Makiki to Waianae. Um, and uh, the settlements, the roads that the Palestinians can't go on, the attitude of the settlers, uh, Israeli military all over the place. Um, uh, you go to help a, a Palestinian farmer pick olives, and up on the hilltop are these uh, settlement outposts, totally, totally illegal under Israeli law, totally illegal. And the settlers come out and they throw stones so the Palestinian cannot olive, uh, harvest their olives. And so the military's there, the IDF, to protect. How do they protect the Palestinians? Um, you don't go into that field. We're protecting you by keeping you from going into your fields because otherwise those Israeli settlers will get out of control. Well, I mean, that's just to give you an idea. And George, I've been to the um, West Bank and helped in the olive um, harvest and all that. Uh, we have uh, a caller on the line, Raymond. Raymond from Kauai. Aloha, Raymond. Oh, how's it, brother? Great okay, show. Good. Great show. Yeah, um, thank you. First of all, I was wondering um, where, where I can get that map that you had, you know, with the bombing that the Israelis uh, perpetrated upon the people of Gaza, you know, one with the figures you showed and how many bombs were dropped. Yeah. Is um, there any way that uh, I can get that map? I'd like to share that with people. Yeah, I can send it to you. So send me your email. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know my email. It's um, um, in the Rollins. Uh, you can uh, see my email. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we got to we gotta get all this information that you guys are um, explaining to us out there in the general community. It's very, very important. You know, because uh, the lie that's perpetuated is that the Israeli government, the Israeli settlers, the colonists are the victims when it's actually the opposite. It's the Palestinians that are uh, the ones that are suffering. So we have to get this information out there. I mean, hopefully sometime in the future we can have you uh, come to our island and uh, do some education for us on this. Sure. Uh, mahalo for the invitation. Yeah. And... Uh. Um, what do you call that now? So I'll be trying to keep in touch with you, and uh, uh, I'd like to get that map so I can share it with sure. people, and uh, I'll uh, listen further to the program. Mahalo, brother. Will do. Mahalo. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah. yeah, well, um, so, Faridi, um, George, what uh, George was saying, yeah, and um, in fact, uh, any uh, comments? Uh, well, t I mean, that's, and um, the caller essentially hints it at the fact that the reality of life uh -huh. it, under occupation is not uh, known, yeah. and uh, yes. not only is not known, is very cleverly hidden yeah. in the way people talk about uh, the issue of Palestine. Um, and Israel. The problem, uh, the problem is always uh, um, uh, what we can do to make sure Israel is secure mm -hmm. uh, because essentially the image that is given is that you have um, these crazy people, these terrorists who are throwing, you know, um, uh, rockets at Israelis for no reason at all. And hiding behind civilians. If, and hiding behind civilians. Uh, exactly. The situation is. Exactly. And uh, therefore, yet uh, very little sense of the kind of life that the Israeli government and settlers have made for the civilians 
in the occupied territories are discussed, yeah. uh, um, uh, right. and uh, that's where the imbalance comes. Right. On that note, <coughs> I want to show um, another uh, PowerPoint that's from uh, United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. It's not about Gaza, but it's about uh, the reality of life for the Palestinians on the occupied territories, which is the West Bank uh, also. And um, I'll, um, we'll show that. Okay, <clears throat> uh, this is um, a few minutes, but it's interesting. This is the checkpoints and roadblocks known as closures, and they are a policy of physical barriers and so on. So this is the West Bank. The West Bank... Uh, actually is um, an interesting, uh, uh, this is like Gaza and the West Bank is 22% of geographic Palestine because Israel sits on 78% of geographic Palestine. And that is uh, more, uh, tw probably 23% uh, more than the, um, uh, piece, uh, the land allotted to the Israeli state uh, by the United Nations in 1947 because the United Nations, uh, in their <coughs> infinite wisdom, gave them 55% of the land. But now Israel is on 78% of the land, discounting the occupied territories, which is Gaza and the uh, West Bank. So these are the closures, right? So now <coughs> I'm going to show you um, the uh, green line. This is the green line is the actual boundary between, uh, or the armistice uh, line, in the 1949 armistice line between uh, Israel that was created on Palestine in 1948, 78%, and the West Bank. This is the green line. Now, the West Bank is um, uh, 2,160 square miles. That's all the West Bank is. Um, as opposed to um, 1948 Israel, uh, it's about 12,000 some um, square miles. Okay, so that uh, shows you the um, proportion. Okay, now <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the Palestinian population, two and a half million approximately. That's where they uh, live in the West Bank, you know, or on the West Bank, uh, depending uh, how you look at it. Now <clears throat> this is. Israeli settlements, uh, which means Israeli uh, colo uh, colonies, on the uh, on the West Bank. Okay, so this is Israeli settlements, right? You know this this thing here. Now, <clears throat> here is la Israeli military areas. Okay, it shows you this the gray part. These are the Israeli military areas. Can you imagine living on quarter of Oahu or not quarter of Oahu, that's Gaza, but can you imagine living on Oahu or the big island with all these <coughs> things happening right there? Um, okay, so that's Israeli military closed areas. Now they have checkpoints and they have par partial checkpoints. The checkpoints are the red, the partial checkpoints are the blue. And uh, you can look, um, like, you know, somebody looked at it and said, oh, it's like going in and out of the zoo, for instance. Okay, now these are the checkpoints, partial and complete checkpoints. Okay. That's what Palestinians have to contend with on a daily basis. This is a trench, right? Um, so that uh, stops movement of vehicles and so on. So these are trenches right there, along with checkpoints. Okay. Now this is a road gate. And here are the road gates in this small area of land, right? And then the checkpoints and all these other things that uh, were shown before. Okay, this is a roadblock, and here are the roadblocks. Okay. So can you imagine living under such a situation every day? So like George Yudis was talking about going from Makiki to Wainai takes you 19 hours. And sometimes you never get there because they won't allow you to get there. Um, these are earth mounds, earth walls. Well, here it is. Okay. So roadblocks and the rest of it with earth mounds and earth walls and blocks and this and that. Uh, try and live. Uh, under such a situation. Um, so these are like road barriers and West Bank barrier. This is the wall, the infamous wall. It's about uh, 703 kilometers, which uh, is roughly about 430 miles. 
Um, <clears throat> this is the wall. Now the wall, as you can see here, is built on, a lot of it is built in the West Bank, and it's not just a straight line or according to the armistice line, but it goes in and cuts off uh, uh, towns and cities and so on, Palestinian towns and cities, and cuts off the farmer from his land that he needs to live off of and so forth. So um, that is not then for Israeli security, but to try and continue the ethnic cleansing of Palestine uh, in the West Bank and Gaza that started actually in 1948 according to Ilan Pape, who is an Israeli historian, and he wrote about uh, how the uh, State of Israel was created through the ethnic cleansing of the indigenous population. And his um, information comes from Israeli archives, not Arabic sources necessarily. Okay, this is uh, the Israeli settlements. Yeah, they are now uh, superimposing everything on top of each other, okay? So that's basically, um, and these are the military areas and so forth. So can you imagine, and this is like uh, flying checkpoints. So they have flying checkpoints. If you go over them, your tires uh, get deflated, okay? So <clears throat> these are the number of checkpoints and everything we, uh, we showed earlier, okay? And so there's a lot of them, right? Now, uh, total number of checkpoints and roadblocks uh, in uh, there, uh, the West Bank. Um, right, and then from uh, July 7th, etc., cetera, it, it went up to this um, uh, number, okay? Now, closure and the humanitarian situation. Under the Fourth Geneva Convention, Israel as an occupying power may apply security measures for immediate military need and specific threat. However, the closure system is collectively applied to all Palestinians throughout the West Bank. For any improvement in the humanitarian and socioeconomic situation, the closures must be removed. And so this is collective punishment illegal under international law and uh, uh, under uh, international humanitarian law. So <clears throat> this is just, uh, um, there are other uh, sources uh, and resources uh, from the uh, uh, Office of, for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, but uh, that's what we have. Okay, we'll end the show. Okay, so um, I just wanted to show this because this is just like depiction of daily life uh, for Palestinians. And uh, that propaganda campaign that Israel, um, in terms of its narrative in the West, especially in the United States, is beginning to have cracks in it. Uh, you were kind of alluding to that. Yeah. Precisely, precisely. That is to say the argument that this is all about security. Yeah but not really about uh, control of territory is falling apart because it's becoming very clear. First of all, the numbers are astounding. Mm -hmm. We are talking about over 400,000 settlers in the West Bank, uh, over 20,000 settlers in the Golan Heights. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, these settlers, uh, many of them are there because they, are so, they have been supported by um, um, the Israeli government and in all likelihood uh, if they are given um, 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 you know means to live elsewhere they would move but many do not and will not and will put up tremendous amount of fight and this reality that it is the Israeli uh, the internal dynamics that pushes it to expand in um, the Middle East has been ignored for all these years and therefore the destabilizing forces that are emanating from the Israeli society um, uh, are ignored. This is not to suggest that there are no Israelis who oppose the settlements, they do. Mm -hmm. But as this particular election today shows, um, you also have very strong forces mm -hmm. that resist any kind of concession. Um, and those forces so far uh, have been able to prevail because throughout all these years that the Israelis were engaged in negotiations, these settlements kept expanding. Mm -hmm. They were not controlled. 
and those expansions were promoted by the same Israeli government that presumably was engaged in a peace process. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things you were mentioning, how uh, uh, like uh, the party that speaks uh, directly and openly about the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, uh, not from the West Bank only, but from Israel Inside. proper, won what, 15 percent of, uh, what is it, 15 seats, 15 right? Fifteen seats it's, out uh, of 120. Yeah. Uh, out of 120, right. And the Arab made party... It, yeah. Made it the yeah. third biggest uh, right. party, yeah. in fact, it... Uh, uh, it is now uh, will have more seats in the parliament mm -hmm. than the founding party of Israel, which yeah. is the Labour Party. The Labour Party. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. How much the Labour Party uh, took? Thirteen. Was Thirteen it? or 13, fourteen? Yeah. Not very clear. Okay, and the Arab Party seven and possibly nine. Nine. Right? Yes. Yeah. There are a couple of Arab parties. Yeah. 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 Together, yeah. The Arab parties. Yeah. yeah right. A couple of them. Yeah. But, um, um, so uh, it will the the new uh, Israeli parliament again will be um, very uh, factionalized yes, and yeah. it will be very, very difficult to form a stable coalition. Mm -hmm. That has always been uh, the case. But what has happened, nevertheless, despite the fact that it is still a very unstable uh, coalition, is that it's very clear that the Israeli polity has moved further to the right mm -hmm. and therefore more resisting of the possibility of any compromise yeah. on the issue of settlements yeah. um, in the West Bank. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, no one in the West uh, who believes in democracy and freedom and all these things condemn uh, that party that uh, directly talks about the ethnic cleansing of the Israeli citizens who, don't, uh, who are not Jewish but Arab, Muslim and Christian. Uh, nobody, uh, you know, uh, says anything. Which uh, leads me to something else about uh, U.S. policy in terms of the Obama administration. We know the Bush administration was a disaster in uh, every respect uh, as regards the Palestinians, but also the rest of the Arabs and the Muslim world. Um, for that, uh, what I wanted to do is I want to go into um, uh, the interview with Noel Kent. Um, and uh, he talks about uh, his understanding or his uh, look at the Obama administration. I'm really skeptical. I, I certainly supported Obama during the election, but I haven't seen. I've seen a lot of uh, Clinton retreads uh, coming, uh, you know, uh, coming across the spectrum here. I don't see at this point. I'm not seeing any decisive break with the Bush strategy of supporting Israel and, and virtually anything the Israelis have done including this, this latest uh, massacre. Uh, I, uh, one good sign, I think, is the fact that George Mitchell, Mitchell has been selected as an envoy because he's been a fair-minded person, I think, in the past in terms of his dealings, and he's knowledgeable about the Middle East. So that's certainly an improvement on the Bush thing. But I think the Obama people have to make a the really decisive break uh, with the Bush strategy of completely supporting the Israelis. Uh, it's just not going to work anymore. Uh, the Zionists, uh, in the Zionist organizations are very powerful in America, APAC and others. Uh, they have a lot of political clout. And uh, the uh, Obama is going to have to basically reject the kind of uh, policies that they advocate. And that's very hard. No democratic administration has ever been able to free themselves from the influence of APAC and, and the Zionist uh, lobby. And Obama is going to have to do that at this point. Well. I mean, any comments? Well, I mean, Obama is faced with very tough choices mm -hmm. because especially the Gaza situation essentially suggested that uh, the Middle East is about to blow or did blow up on his face. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, if um, he wants to pursue um, um, uh, his policy of trying to mm -hmm. improve the American image in mm -hmm. the region, ultimately reduce American forces from the region, um, um, uh, reduce the extent of anti-Americanism mm -hmm. in the region, there has to be 
um, some um, parting of ways right. uh, between the Israeli policies um, uh, and American policies. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the Bush administration uh, pursued the policy of allowing what he, they called uh, reality in the gr on the ground making the decision. And essentially what that meant was that whoever was powerful uh, mm -hmm. would pursue whatever policies they wanted to, and the Israelis have done that and have you know, as we talked about before, that has led to two very destructive war with major consequences for the region, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, let's face it, what happened in Gaza is not only uh, traumatic for the Gazaian people, it will have consequences for countries like Egypt or Jordan yes. because the populations of those countries are unhappy mm -hmm. with the decisions that their leaders have made in support of Israeli attack yeah. on Gaza. So if nothing is done um, and a genuine peace process that is equitable uh, and goes beyond the old parameters, even Clinton parameters, that effectively only focus on the issue of Israeli security, mm -hmm. um, 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 the United States will lose the support of the so-called moderate okay. Arab leaders who right. are... Uh, if they're still there. If they are still there, yeah. because yeah. the situation is extremely destabilizing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you have um, uh, um, a Saudi king essentially saying, this is a disaster, do something about it, um, um, uh, you know, um, it's not only... You better it, listen. <laughs> you better listen. <laughs> if because you're smart. The, the, yes, mm. because you are essentially, they are essentially making an argument right. that this is making our lives extremely difficult and not allowing those forces that are uh, in the middle uh, to have an impact uh, because the anger will push people towards um, uh, forces that um, um, are extremely polarized in the region yeah. and are extremely destabilizing. Right. Um, now the Israelis and at times the Americans have found a solution to solve this problem mm -hmm. and what they do is to say, um, to externalize the problem and say that all the problems are emanating from the radical forces and the center of that radicalism is Iran. Is Iran yeah. Okay, well uh, that story is not mm -hmm. going to go very far. Right. As I said, one of the things that the Gaza operation did is to break that image That's right. because the reality is that it actually what it did is it focused uh, the attention of the world on the real problem or the Israeli problem which is the Israeli inability to deal with its occupation mm -hmm. uh, uh, so and that problem yeah. was not created by Iran. That's Occupation right. was not created by Iran. So um, um, that strategy, um, I mean, they're going to try. They're going to try to make nuclear Iran the source of, you know, or an, an, an Iran that is aspiring to be nuclear, uh, the source of all the problems in the Middle East. But the reality yeah. is uh, that, uh, you know, as people begin to look at the pictures that you showed and the nature of the occupation, um, and the dysfunctional Israeli politics that is becoming even more dysfunctional, uh, then it becomes very, very difficult to say the problem is Iran. That's right. Um, yeah. You have to end up saying, no, you have to come face to face with this right. reality. No, the problem is Israel and its inability yeah. to deal That's right. uh, with occupation. Yeah, in fact, uh, you recently uh, wrote an article, uh, uh, Israel, Gaza, the return of an emboldened Iran and Obama. And uh, it was um, published on the electronic uh, journal uh, Strategic Insights. Uh, nice. You want to say anything beyond what you just said about the article and about the situation? Well, um, uh, what I was trying to say in that article is that there is an irony involved mm -hmm. there, which is that there is a pattern. Okay, whether we are talking about the United States or Israel, you have. Uh, these players that actually go and invade other countries, okay, um, or other te other territories, they engage in an incredibly um, um, offensive act mm -hmm. 
in the name of freedom, in the name of security, whatever, then they create a situation, okay, that is out of their control or does not solve their problem, okay? Uh, but instead of going back and looking at what they have done that has created that situation, they end up talking about uh, the fact that we have a new reality that has emboldened Iran. Mm -hmm. Okay, and therefore we should engage in further acts to contain this emboldened Iran without looking at the reality that it was their own actions. Mm -hmm. For example, United States actions in Iraq that unleashed a Shiite majority very close to the Iranian government or Afghanistan getting rid of an Iranian enemy, right. the Taliban, that has increased the strategic weight of Iran in the region. It's been American actions that has increased the clout of Iran, or the Israeli attack on Gaza and Hamas uh, that has increased the popularity of Iran because Iran, um, uh, unlike many Arab countries, has condemned what happened, and therefore it has become popular in the region. So it's a, it's a very ironic situation, mm -hmm. is that an offensive action um, has led to increased popularity of Iran, but instead of these countries going and looking at what they have done that has led to this situation, again, they, they keep maintaining the same discourse of emboldened Iran as a uh, pretext mm -hmm. for the continuation of their offensive yeah. policies. It's, it's interesting. It's just uh, like a drug addict. These are war addicts, and they think that they're going to, you know, get their uh, whatever satisfaction through war. And yeah. that actually backfires. Uh, we have uh, a caller on the line, Jay from Kaimuki. Aloha, Jay. Yes, hello. Hello. How are you doing? Good. I think Americans are basically very I, I can't hear you very well. Uh, is that okay now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. I think America needs to be educated about what Zionism is all about. You know? uh, yes, I agree with you. Well, we agree with you on that, yeah. I said yeah. two other things. Mm -hmm. They need to understand what the Jewish Talmud is about. And uh, the uh, two blue lines on the Israeli flag that uh, this is greater Israel. And they're, they're yeah, really I'm having a hard time... Uh, Hearing, uh, what are the two blue lines on the Israeli flag representing? And uh, I want to read a quote from uh, the Zionist, uh, Menachem Begin. Can I read it? Um, yeah, if it's not too long, because uh, we have uh, another caller on the line, and we have only like two, three, uh, however many minutes, uh, maybe three minutes or something. Okay. Like yeah. Well, anyway, quote, he says, our race, the Jews, is uh, the master race. We are divine gods of this planet. Uh, we are as different from the inferior races as they are from insects. In fact, compared to our race, other races are beasts and animals. Well, cattle um, and that. Yeah. Other um, races are considered as human excrement. Our destiny is to rule over the inferior races. Our earthly kingdom will be ruled by our leader with a rod of iron. Well, the masses will lick our feet and okay. at our feet. This is yeah. Malachi Begin, who is the Prime Minister of Israel. And this mentality, this Zionist mentality, pervades a lot of Israeli thought. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, um, Jay. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Um, we have a few more minutes. Uh, Bob from Pearl City. Bob, aloha. Aloha. I appreciate your program, and I almost hate to interrupt the flow of your of your great dialogue here. No problem. But uh, I appreciated Raymond's call about education and information, and I would like, please, to put in a plug for www.ifamericansnew.org. Mm. That's an awesome informational site. There are flyers. There was just one printed or published yesterday that could be printed out and used as used as flyers on the Gaza situation. So that's all I want to say, www.ifamericansnew.org. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, right, I just want to um, say something because I think it's important for people to sort of understand that 
um, uh, what we are talking about, whether we are talking about Israel or United States or Iran or um, other Arab countries, uh, where you actually have this urge for um, war, as you call it, um, uh, we are talking about uh, part of these societies. We are essentially, I mean, all these societies, all these political systems actually have um, 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 hardliners, what you call it, that effectively feed on each other. Um, uh, and in a sense create a cycle of violence that cannot be disrupted. But in the same societies, even in, in Israeli societies, you have a peace movement, you have opponents of settlement policies. They want a, um, um, you know, an Israeli society that can live with its neighbors. But in you know, um, yeah, they have been yeah. checkmated right, 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 uh, right, right. Uh, by um, this cycle of uh, yeah. violence. And I think American foreign policy, because it has given um, um, total support for whatever the Israelis uh, uh, want to do, in effect, has um, um, strengthened the hardline forces and um, weakened the forces that have always yeah. been, have pushed uh, for um, a more peaceful neighborhood. Right, yeah. So uh, we have a few more minutes. I want to go to um, um, another uh, segment from George Hughes' uh, interview. Uh, so uh, if we can uh, see that and then we can, we have one minute or so to discuss it. Most surveys that I've seen, and once again surveys and surveys, are that APAC that represents a minority in the American Jewish community. And this is why you've had the growth in recent years of organizations like Brit Sedek Vishalom, uh, J Street. Now these are fairly mainline. You also have a little bit more radical, such as Jewish Voice for Peace. But uh, Brit Sedek Vishalom and J Street specifically came about because they felt another voice was needed in Washington representing the Jewish community. And they have, they have not supported this caste-led tragedy. Uh, they, they've not supported Israel in this. They're, they're, they are supporting the appointment of Senator Mitchell. Well, I mean, uh, here again, that the propaganda Precisely. machine is beginning to have like some cracks. I mean, it's not disappearing or vanishing uh, at all. It's still powerful, etc. But at least, you know, there's some hope in uh, another narrative uh, taking hold, you know, or other narratives taking hold, not just the dominant. Uh, no, precisely. One, yeah. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, 60 Minutes had uh, a show right. about, I um, had a, a section on Simon, uh, Bob Simon yeah. went to Israel, actually showing the lives uh, of Palestinians under occupation. And he came under attack. Tremendous yeah, yeah. attack by um, uh, Anti-Defamation yeah. League, by APAC, but J Street, mm -hmm. which is a new mm -hmm. um, um, Jewish lobby, mm -hmm. as opposed we have had information uh, groups mm -hmm. uh, like um, um, Israeli Policy Forum and uh, so on that have been liberal organizations, but this one is a lobby, you mm -hmm. know, actually yeah. uh, will support candidates, mm -hmm. gives them money if they take Pro progressive positions yeah. on the Palestinian issue. Right. Uh, therefore, and they have been very supportive yeah. and they have tried to mobilize a campaign um, um, in support of 60 Minutes. So yeah. I think that, things that's are good. Changing. And Simon, you know, is Jewish uh, too. I mean, uh, but uh, other um, Jewish groups also are leading. Uh, the way uh, towards like divestment from Israel, uh, Israel or Israeli or companies that deal with Israel uh, and that would influence the West Bank uh, occupation and so forth. So we are flat out of time, uh, I'm told. And so thanks uh, to our viewers and uh, thank you, Faride, for coming and see you uh, next month. Aloha.